My name is Lorene Marchand. I'm a painter. I work in oils and I paint very realistic looking images that aren't about the realism. They're about the ideas behind them. When I'm, when I'm painting, I'm always working from photographs and almost all of them are my own. Every once in a while I steal them from the mighty Google, but not very often because I like the light that I understand. So I start with the photographs. I tinker with them in my computer and my goal is to make them look, make the image look like it did when I saw it, not like what the camera saw or what it looked like when I was experiencing it. No paint, almost no painting is composed of just one photograph. I put them together. I'll, I'll have four or five different photos that I'm working from and I put them together on the painting surface using drawing. Um, scaling, scaling them up and down so that they, so that they fit. And I do a lot of drawing. I do a lot of drawing before I start. So it's, I'm filling in spaces after that. But because I work in oil paint, it has a mind of its own and it never ends up. It's not that I have a preconception, but it certainly doesn't look like the photograph, even though I'm working from photos. Again, because it's oil paint, it's very forgiving and you can paint into it or on top of it or up to the edges of it. The paint stays workable for days so I can paint part, paint another part, go back, replace it, make them work together better. And I stop when I can't make it look any better, and it's done. I did my BFA at the University of Alberta, and then many years later I went back and got an MFA at the University of Saskatchewan. It happens that they were both formalist art schools, so I must have been frustrating for a lot of the faculty. <laughs> but I learned a lot about concept and design. At the University of Alberta, it was really important that you be able to talk about what you were doing. There's a, there's a common thread through a series of paintings. And then sometimes it might look as though the thread snapped, but the thought process leads from one to another. For example, I worked with figures for many years, and then during the production of an exhibition that ended up touring for a year and a half, the figures began to leave. And it was hard to finish that, finish that exhibition because it was as though the figures were walking out in front of me. But when I began work again, I looked for something that would stand in for the figure, and I discovered the rose which has so much symbolism attached to it, you can make it mean almost anything. And then I painted roses, not, not roses in the first flush of beauty, but old dried roses, which are still beautiful. I painted those for a long time, and they slowly gave way to paintings with still lifes in them that began to be about the way that light is, um, light is a liar. And then something else happens. So then it became still lifes with landscapes, and now it's landscapes with birds and still lifes. So there is a thread, it just, it's sometimes a long arc. My family was entirely inartistic. My mother and my sister, my mother was and my sister still is musical. Um, I always liked what I called making things. I didn't know that that was even a phrase, I just made things. And until I was in high school, I never saw, I never met an artist or saw a painting that was in real life, except I had an aunt who did paint by numbers. When I was in grade 11, a new, I met a new girl. She moved from Calgary to Edmonton and came to my high school. And she had always been good at art. So she'd always been able to take art classes. That was the beginning of grade 11. I began to get to know her, and by the time I was applying for university the following year, I was applying to art school. So there was something there that was just waiting, and there's never been anything else I wanted to do. So I'm probably in the studio most days by 10.30 or 11, and then if 
if nothing else happens, I'll be there till five. Um, I don't tend to take days off, but other things do happen. Right now, I'm in the last couple of months, I've just started a new business, which is it's called Grasslands Gallery Online, with a tagline of beautiful Saskatchewan art. And so I haven't been in the studio as much as I normally would be. Sometimes I think I can hear it whimpering to me, feeling lonesome. But that's not a permanent state. It's getting getting the gallery up and running was a fair number of hours. So I'm I'm back at work. I'm back at work in the studio now. And I'm kind of dividing the time a little better. But my goal is always to be in the studio five or six days a week. Val Marie is a very tiny community, 125 to 135 people, never more in a beautiful setting, but it is isolated. And I'm, I'm, but in the end, I'm not sure it affects my art practice, except that I'm, I have more time. I don't have to spend as much time earning a living as I did when I lived in the city. Sometimes I feel isolated from other artists, but I've maintained my good artist friendships from when I lived in Saskatoon. And I was there for 25 years, so I, I, I got to know a lot of artists in that time. I think the, I think the biggest thing for me is, is having the freedom to live the artist's life that I want. And of course, in the last couple of years, everybody's been isolated. So some of feeling isolated is fear of missing out. And if everybody's in the same boat, you're not missing it. And, and I am close to one of the most beautiful landscapes in the province, if not the country. There's no sound here at night. I took the garbage out last night about nine o'clock in the dark, and I lived in City Park in Saskatoon for 20 years and never took the garbage out at nine o'clock at night in the dark. Last night I encountered a deer who was standing around on my front lawn. <laughs> Otherwise I could have danced down the street, you know, so it's safe, it's quiet. Um, the population's a bit different in the summer, so you, because of the visitors to the park. So you you know, you might run into some different people to talk to. When I first started painting, when I was in art school, I was very attracted to the work of Alex Colville and Christopher Pratt. And, and there were other artists who I discovered who were Canadian, who were painting realistic looking paintings. My work has never looked like theirs, but I think I have the influence of the stillness that was in their work. After that, I think I'm kind of a magpie. I, I pick up ideas and, and I pick up images and, and I think, oh, that's interesting. I wonder how that would work. So it's so nothing, nothing continuous after that. My short-term goals are always to make the next painting. I've got, I've got, I'm producing work for an, um, a couple of Christmas seasonal exhibitions, so they'll be smaller paintings. I've always got ideas for the next things, and I'm looking forward. I'm just, I'm just looking forward. Because I'm building the gallery, it's things are a little more interrupted right now. I never know how to answer people's questions about long-term goals. I'm going to be 72 in a couple of months, and sometimes I think my, my goal in five years is to still be breathing. So that's the best I can do. Most of my supplies I order online. It's been pretty easy to order online or by phone for a long time. In the last couple of years, I've just made it easier. And then if I do get to Saskatoon, one of the places I always go to is art placement because it's so much nicer to be able to hold the things. I go through a lot of pencil sharpeners because the pencils I use for the underdrawing, they're called a pit oil based pencil and they, they're they fairly soft but they seem to chew up pencil, pencil sharpeners. Yeah, you'd have to have a special pencil for oil? Um, you don't have to but the thing about these is because they're an oil based pencil they don't bleed through oh, okay. and I 
I remember the last time I used a normal pencil and I thought, I'm never doing this again. There has to be something else. Um, the ones I use are called Sanguine, which is a reddish color. But the oil base is perfect. It, the oil just slides over the top of it. It doesn't, it might show through, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't bleed. I like a particular kind of paint from a manufacturer named M. Graham, which is an American, because it's a walnut base. Because my studio is right in the living area of my home, I don't want to use toxic materials. I use very little um, cleaning solution. I use one that's made from what's left of orange oil after they make orange liqueur. And when it's fresh out of the container, you can smell the oranges after I've, but I will literally use the stuff in the bottom of a jar for months and months, reuse it. In between cleaning the brushes with that stuff, I leave them in vegetable oil overnight, which helps keep them soft, just standing up. And I also clean them in something called a master's brush cleaner, which is a, it's just like a fat cake of soap. Um, that rinses off with water, but it doesn't damage the brush hairs. And I use both natural brushes and synthetic ones, and they all seem happy enough with this. The um, natural brushes will wear out standing in the oil for too many nights in a row, and I accept that as the, my payment for sloppiness, because <laughs> I should clean them more often. But I hate cleaning brushes, and then I think, I'll clean them tomorrow, I'll just stick them back in the oil. But I just use um, ordinary salad oil. If there was an emotional undertone to all my paintings, I would hope that it would be hope. I want, my goal when I'm painting is that people should recognize themselves and their own experience and feel positively towards that. I decided a long time ago that if I could make something look the most like itself in a painting, someone else might recognize themselves there. And by making it look most like itself, I don't mean making a photographically realistic rendering. I mean catching the spirit of the thing, whether it's animate or inanimate, human or object. If you make the work, you will want to show someone the work, and then show someone the work, and then make more work. Accept that it's not all going to happen tomorrow. You have to have a long vision. Um, and if someone says that your work isn't the right kind of work, just keep making the work anyway. One person's opinion does not an art career make. I have shown my work in commercial galleries for a long time. Um, I've always made part of a living from my work. I've never made a whole living. One of the reasons I opened this new online-only art gallery is because I really would like to enhance the possibilities for artists making a living. I know a lot of people were really scared when everything closed a year and a half ago that no one would see their artwork. And I don't see what I'm doing as competition. I see it as offering more opportunities. I may be looking at a two-person public gallery exhibition in sometime in the next couple of years. I'm expecting a studio visit sometime not too far down the road. And I think my last public gallery exhibition was probably 2014, um, but I've been showing regularly in commercial galleries since then. I've had up until recently had two in real life commercial galleries um, in Canada and one in Ireland. And now I've got one storefront gallery and my own gallery, which is online, and still the one in Ireland. But it's harder to keep up the connection with the one in Ireland since I haven't been able to go back there recently. But but they're still there. They're still working. So it's my Ireland is my the second home of my heart. I went there the first time in two thousand three to paint my stated goal was to paint and make friends if I could and have another different kind of life for a while. And I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with the country 
and the sound of people's voices and the coastal weather um, and being near the ocean. I was, I was there in 2018 and 2019. I was supposed to be back last fall to teach, but of course that didn't happen. But they're still open to me coming back when, the, when it's possible. So maybe next year. I guess I do have a long range plan. It goes all the way to next year. It's called Skywatch, and it's the beginning of a series, not, not the very first one, but it's part of a series It's developing that places the birds kind of out of context in their environment, but out of context. So I've made some where the bird is paired with a still life, or sometimes just a flower. Often there's sky in the background or just a piece of the sky and the rest of it might be more abstract. Most of them have got this, some version of the gold band in it, um, or more than one gold band. Maybe it's all those years of formalist training finally coming out, but I've discovered I this element of abstraction is part of my intention of reminding the viewer that that they are part of this. You know, this is a painting, it's got edges. It doesn't exist unless you see it and think something about it. And I, I guess I'm also feeling a bit didactic when I'm making them because I want to, sh I want to show how beautiful these things are, these birds, this landscape, even that bit of human-made gold, and hope people take it into their hearts. This is a house finch, and he's in his best girl catch, girlfriend catching colors. Later on in the season, they're not nearly as, as sparkly looking as this. And when I paint the birds, I try to give them just a little bit of a smile, because birds can look kind of fierce because their lips turned down, but I try to turn them up just a little without making it cartoony. Mm -hmm.